Okay, Eric is going to tell us all about Bitbucket. Uh, with a focus on Git, Eric? Is it, judging by your shirt? Just with Git? Yeah. Yeah, with a, uh, with a focus on Git. Okay. All right. Well, it's a lot of faces. More than I think I've ever seen in one uh, room staring at me. Um, we'll see how this goes. Uh, so I'm Eric, and I am with Atlassian. And I work on, uh, on Bitbucket. I'm one of the uh, more back end developers uh, on Bitbucket. Uh, and I'm going to tell you all about Bitbucket's architecture and infrastructure, um, or at least as much as I can in 30 minutes. Uh, before I do that, though, I want to share with you this photo. And those who don't instantly recognize uh, the rocket here, this is a Saturn V rocket. Uh, it's the, uh, the rocket from the Ap Apollo program. That's the, uh, the moon rocket. So that's the one that, or maybe not that particular one, but got uh, uh, Armstrong to the, uh, to the moon and back. And I want to show it to you because it's like the, the whole Apollo program is, I find, a, like a fascinating piece of history. And I'm sure I'm not alone here. Um, it's a, like this rocket when they built this, yeah, and I guess the, the program around it, uh, were really sort of the, the pinnacle of uh, uh, innovation and engineering at the time. And, um, a goal that they set out to, to achieve was so ridiculously ambitious uh, in the 60s, sending a man to the moon and bringing him back, when the, I guess the state of the art was you know, the Russians who had just flung a, a chunk of metal into orbit. Um, it was quite something. Enormous undertaking. I think at some point like 500,000 people were working on it. Ridiculously large, billions of dollars. Um, um, but it worked. And, uh, and so you must sort of assume that you know, only really the, the smartest people uh, worked on that and were able to, uh, to pull this off. So quite literally, rocket science. And uh, I'm a bit of a nerd. And like, earlier this year, I actually went to Florida and visited the, uh, the Kennedy Space Center in uh, Cape Canaveral. And they've got one of these, uh, these things on permanent display. So there's a, uh, here it is, a, uh, an actual remaining Saturn V rocket that they've, uh, they've taken apart into the, uh, the separate uh, rocket stages. And, uh, and you, so you can see it up close. You can see sort of what's inside, right? And what struck me when I was there and I looked at this, um, the first time I'd ever seen this stuff, is that it, it looked sort of, I don't know, simple, maybe that's not the right word, but rudimentary perhaps. As in, it was very functional, right? Look at this thing. What it, it's, it's like a, a sheet of rolled up metal around a, I guess, a massive gas tank, right? I mean, it's really not much more there. I mean, there's some, some plumbing, but even that is limited, right? And, um, you know, I guess I never really considered, really considered what would be inside of a rocket like that uh, to be able to do the, the things that it did. But um, I guess I sort of expected something more complex, you know, more ingenious, I don't know. Um, it's a similar story at the, uh, at the back or the bottom. It sort of, you know, it ends here, there's a, there's a flat surface, and, you know, we'll just bolt some engines on the, uh, at the bottom. If you're, uh, if you're there, you can actually see the, the engine mounts, like the screws and everything. It's not really polished, you see uh, bolts protruding everywhere. And, now I don't mean to disrespect the Apollo program, by the way, I mean, it's, it's still as uh, amazing as, it, as I thought it was, um, but it's sort of seeing this stuff up close, sort of, I don't know, made it more approachable. It, it brought it down to earth, if you will. And, um, and I think that is uh, uh, representative of how we uh, tend to perceive technology that we have in high regard, but we don't really know much about. Uh, we tend to assume that things are more complicated than they really are, and, uh, and that the people working on it are, uh, by definition, much smarter than we are. You know, the whole grass is greener thing. Um, and it is that potential perception that I want to debunk today by uh, laying out the uh, architecture uh, uh, behind Bitbucket and, uh, and also at the same time share some anecdotes and I guess you know some of the instances where we we screwed up so if you are a little bit like me and you sort of you tend to assume that other people are smarter than you then uh, you'll be glad to hear that there's really no rocket science behind uh, Bitbucket and um, you know everything uh, that is running now is sort of built around the same tools that you will uh, use yourself. So sort of try to break it down a little bit. Uh, so this is roughly the architecture of Bitbucket. I've uh, 
I've separated it into three logical uh, areas. So there's the, uh, the web layer, which is uh, responsible for uh, load balancing, uh, high availability, that kind of stuff. Then there's the, the application layer. Uh, that's where you know the, our code is, that's where all the Python stuff is. Uh, Bitbucket is uh, almost exclusively written in Python. Um, and then lastly, the storage layer where we, uh, you know, we keep our repository data and all that. So we'll talk about each layer individually and time permitting, I'll uh, share some anecdotes. Uh, so the, um, the first layer, the web layer, um, consists really of uh, two machines only. So Bitbucket is all, there's no virtualization in Bitbucket. We run real hardware. Uh, we manage them ourselves. We have a data center uh, in the US and uh, we have two load balancer machines. And uh, those are the, they own the, the two IP addresses that you see when you resolve bitbucket.org. And um, these machines basically run uh, Nginx and HAProxy. And web traffic that comes into uh, uh, to the load balancer first hits uh, Nginx. Nginx is a, for those who don't know it, is a, it's an open source web server. Um, it's, it's pretty good at SSL. Uh, it, it can also be used really well for uh, reverse proxying. And that's what we do here on this layer. Um, so when a request comes in, uh, it is encrypted. Everything on Bitbucket is always encrypted. Uh, so the first thing we do is strip off the, uh, the encryption. And that's done using uh, Nginx. And, um, and then once it's decrypted, we forward it on to HAProxy, which runs on the same machine. Uh, HAProxy, also an open source uh, reverse proxy server, but it's really good at uh, doing load balancing and, and failover when you have a whole bunch of backend servers. And so that HAProxy inspects the, uh, the request and based on some properties decides how to forward it on. And ultimately, it will forward it on to one of our many uh, actual application servers. And on there, there is another Nginx instance. And uh, so this Nginx instance also just a reverse proxy server. It's not our actual web server. Uh, it takes care of things like uh, uh, request logging, uh, compression, response compression, and um, asynchronous response and uh, request buffering. Um, and that's why, logically, it's part of the web layer, because it doesn't actually process the request. And then ultimately, that forwards it on to the, the real Python web server on the application server. <laughs> now, so that's HTTPS. Uh, we also do SSH. Yeah, and SSH is a, takes a bit of a different path. Uh, SSH is a, is a, you know, it's a different protocol. We can't easily decrypt it first, and so, but we do need to load balance it. So it does go through HAProxy, um, just as a TCP connection. In, uh, and HAProxy then forwards it on to the least loaded backend server. So that path is a lot simpler, um, but make no mistake, it's not necessarily easier to run that uh, reliably. Um, as we, uh, we found out really just recently when um, users started to complain about uh, SSH connections uh, dropping out sometimes, uh, like users would say that you know, they'd get hung up on. Uh, and, uh, and looking at the error messages, it seemed like that was uh, indicative of a capacity problem like we had like, not enough capacity on the server side basically to handle the request rate. Uh, but our monitoring tools told us a different story, that we had plenty of capacity. And so we were stumped for a little while until we, uh, we started uh, analyzing the network traffic on the, uh, the load balancers. In, uh, in particular, uh, we looked at the, the frequency of SYN packets that were arriving. And so a SYN packet, SYN packets are part of TCP, and it marks the start of a new TCP connection. And so timestamping those, uh, each single one of them, uh, gives you a really good, accurate view of the incoming traffic. And you see that here. So what you see here is a, uh, an interval of 16 minutes over which we uh, captured every SYN packet. And, uh, and you can see right away that it is ridiculously spiky. And uh, these spikes are, aside from being very high and very thin, are also very evenly spaced. If you count them, you'll see that there are 16 spikes in an interval of 16 minutes. And um, there's no coincidence, uh, these spikes occur at the start of every minute, like precisely at the start of every minute. They last about one to two seconds only. Uh, but you can see that the rate at that point is ridiculously high. It's like three to four times higher than our, our average load. Now, our working theory behind this is that this is um, uh, the result of con thousands of continuous integration servers all around the world that are configured to uh, periodically pull their Bitbucket repos. Um, and, uh, and that in combination with uh, NTP, everybody, I guess, these days uses NTP, and clocks are really accurate, and uh, <laughs> so this is what you get. And, uh, and that was a bit of a problem, because even though we, we have enough capacity for the average rate, um, during these spikes, uh, we actually don't have enough capacity. Now, solving this, um, it's not 
we can't really quadruple our SSH infrastructure to be able to uh, deal with these large spikes. And so what we did instead is we went back into the, uh, the web layer into uh, Proxy, where we basically have a hook into that traffic that comes in. And uh, we configured Proxy to never forward uh, traffic at a rate higher than what we knew uh, our capacity could take. But then don't make any changes to the ingress side. And so during these spikes, uh, HAProxy will happily accept all the incoming traffic, uh, but it won't actually connect or forward all of the uh, connections at once. And so it sort of spreads it out over you know, a few seconds. And now the, uh, like this graph on the application servers is a lot smoother than it is on the, uh, on the load balancer side. You could probably see it if you, if you have a cron job and you, 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 know, you start it um, at that very uh, start of the minute every time versus any other second. It'll probably have a few seconds less uh, lag. So it's a bit of a funny pro problem. Never really considered it until uh, it crept up. Um, probably won't have it really with websites that have humans click on links, uh, but if you operate like a public API that is uh, very popular and people script against it, you might see similar issues. So the application layer then. So this is where all the, the magic happens, sort of. Uh, this is where the, uh, the website runs, uh, and this this layer is distributed across many tens of, uh, of servers, real servers. And, um, like, so they all run a whole bunch of stuff. They run the website. The website is a, uh, uh, a fairly standard Django app, really. Like Bitbucket started out as a uh, pretty much 100% Django app, and it's still very important. Um, and uh, we run that in Gunnicorn, the web server. Uh, Gunnicorn, Python web server um, that is relatively simple. Um, and we run it in perhaps the most basic configurations. We use a sync worker, meaning that uh, our processes uh, process one request at a time, and so we have a whole bunch of processes and multiprocessing to get concurrency. Um, and then SSH, uh, we handle SSH uh, using really just the standard open SSHD uh, server daemon, uh, the same one that you all run on your Linux machines and uh, laptops, um, with one difference. So we uh, we made a small change to it, a, a small patch that allows us to use the database, do lookups in the database for public keys. Like OpenSSHD looks on the file system, it's hardwired to look at the file system to find public keys. Uh, it's not practical for us, and so we have a little change to make that happen. Other than that, it is the standard uh, OpenSSHD uh, server, so we don't need to maintain that. We also do uh, background processing, so any sort of job or process that we can't guarantee will uh, respond in a few milliseconds, uh, we dispatch off to, uh, to our background system. And uh, that's comprised of a, uh, a cluster of high available uh, RabbitMQ servers. RabbitMQ is, the, uh, is an open source Erlang implementation of AMQP broker. broker. Um, and to consume jobs, we uh, use Celery. So we have a whole farm of Celery distributed across all these machines. Uh, to process these uh, jobs. Like examples of that are if you fork a repo, for instance, there's actual copying of files involved, uh, so that it might not uh, complete immediately. Uh, that's dis dispatched. So it looks very basic, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's you know the same components that you all run, uh, distributed statelessly across multiple servers. There's nothing really special about it. As simple is usually good. In uh, we've had this uh, set up uh, for years. In uh, Bitbucket is now. I think over 30, 35 times bigger than it was when we started, when we acquired it, I should say, and, um, and this held up really well. However, you can still screw up, um, as we do from time to time. And uh, one of those examples was um, when we uh, uh, decided to upgrade our password hashes. Um, so up until that time, we never stored passwords in our database, but we stored salted SHA-1 hashes, which is very common. And um, so that means that if somebody, for some reason, gets a hold of our database, uh, they only have hash values, and so you know, um, they still don't have your password. However, SHA-1 hashes for passwords are slowly being phased out uh, and replaced by more strong, secure hashing algorithms. And um, the reason for that is, um, is that even though you can't decrypt a SHA-1 hash to get a password, what you can do is think of a word that might be the password, compute the SHA-1, and then compare it with what's in the database. And if you just think of enough words, and you try enough combinations, you might brute force the password. Now, if you have a strong password, uh, chances of anybody brute forcing that through SHA-1 are, gotta be careful with some cryptographers maybe here in the, in the room, but let's call it negligible. Um, 
However, we have millions of users on Bitbucket, and not everybody has a strong password. And if you have a password that is a word in the dictionary, then, uh, well, I don't have to tell you, I guess, then uh, it's a whole different story, because there really aren't many words in the dictionary. Certainly not when it comes to a computer computing SHA-1 values for it. And so you're really at risk. Now, I, short of forcing people to not use simple passwords, um, uh, another thing you can do is, is sort of upgrade to a stronger hash. Now, what these things do, they're nothing special, really. Um, but they're hash values or hash algorithms that uh, are more expensive, deliberately more expensive, by rehashing their hash value over and over again, thousands of times, deliberately spending more CPU cycles. And, and that's what we wanted to uh, upgrade to. And let me show you just how big that difference is. So we wanted to upgrade to bcrypt hashes. bcrypt is one of the sort of more modern uh, iteration style uh, cryptographic uh, hash algorithms. In, um, and we compared it with SHA-1. So this script uh, measures how many hash values you can generate in one second. And for bcrypt, you can see that my laptop was able, so this, this uses Django's code, so Django's hashing algorithms, all that code, with the required, or required, with the optional C extensions to make it as fast as you can. On my laptop, that is, um, amounts to three hashes per second for bcrypt versus 160,000 for SHA-1. So it's five orders of magnitude more expensive, just CPU cycles. And so that is absolutely huge. And it's great because it means that even your weak password <clears throat> may stand a chance. But you have to realize that as a uh, server, you have to incur that cost of that massively expensive uh, calculation every single time somebody uses a password for authentication. And we run a really uh, popular high volume API, and a lot of people uh, use basic auth for authentication. It's all SSL, right, so it's not like it's plain text passwords, um, but it means that we have to compute bcrypts for every single request. And our re API requests are relatively quick, like on average, um, it's in the, in the tens of milliseconds. So you can imagine that if you add a 300 millisecond password check to every single one of these requests, you have a problem. And we did, because we naively rolled this out, and instantaneously the website went down. Uh, all cores and all the machines and all CPUs uh, went to 100% and uh, were calculating bcrypts. Now we realized our mistake fairly quickly, obviously not quickly enough, but fairly quickly. So we rolled it back and were able to keep the downtime uh, minimal. Um, but then we had a bit of a problem because we still wanted to move away from SHA-1. Now you can't really make bcrypt cheaper. Actually, you can, but you don't want to because the whole point is to have an expensive uh, uh, algorithm. And so what we could do, however, is do less of it. You know, when people use the API to, uh, and, and write a client, they typically do more than one request in quick succession. In, um, and so they'd be using the same password over and over again, and we'd be computing the same bcrypt over and over again. And so we decided to implement a sort of two-stage hashing system where when a request comes in, um, instead of computing the expensive bcrypt, we now compute a uh, old-fashioned salted SHA-1 value, and then we use that to look up in an in-memory uh, map dictionary uh, the bcrypt value. Now, if that's empty in the beginning, we then compute the bcrypt value ourselves, uh, check it against the database to see if your password is correct, and then store that mapping, like SHA-1 versus uh, bcrypt, in that in-memory uh, table. And then the next request that you make with the same password is able to look up the bcrypt value from the in-memory cache. Now, that way we're able to cut out, I'm guessing, 99% of all the, the bcrypt uh, calculations. Um, but it's, it's important to understand the ramification of this uh, system, right? Because you might be tempted to, uh, to think that, well, you've now sort of weakened your, your bcrypt uh, authentication down, back down to SHA-1 uh, strength. But it's that whole story. Right, the, the important thing, or the main thing, I guess, is that uh, SHA-1 values never hit cold storage anymore. So the database is all bcrypt. So if you get a hold of a, of a database, you still only have bcrypts. And even if you were able to somehow tap into our servers and, and get a hold of, uh, like, copy memory access, then um, you'd get some SHA-1s. But you'd only get SHA-1s from the users that are active at that very moment. Because these cache entries, that's essentially what they are, are ex uh, expunged very, very quickly. So. We were able to, uh, to get this thing running and um, upgrade to, uh, uh, to bcrypt, but um, even then, the, uh, uh, 
like the remaining sort of 1% of the, uh, the time that we spent on Bcrypt is still uh, very significant. Very significant. Just look at that ratio, right? 160,000 versus three. In, um, and right now, today, if you look at one of our servers in, uh, and you run like a perf top or something, you can see that the, uh, the Bcrypt cipher method um, is the, uh, the most expensive method that runs on that machine. In, uh, at any point in time, I think it eats like 12% CPU. So it's still hugely expensive. Uh, so in the future, I guess, uh, we should probably be looking at uh, migrating uh, or offering something like an alternative to basic auth, uh, maybe, you know, like standard, relatively standard uh, HTTP auth tokens, um, which are revocable and have a, a limited uh, privilege set. Um, and then let's move on to the, uh, the storage layer. So here we, uh, we keep track of layer data, obviously. The, uh, the biggest amount of data that we uh, store, of course, is the, uh, the contents of your repositories. And um, there are millions and millions of repositories. And we decided to keep the, the storage of that as simple as we could, like sort of in line with, with uh, everything else that you've seen so far. Um, and we decided to just store that stuff on file systems, um, just like you do on your, on your local machines, right? Uh, Git and Mercurial were, were designed for file systems. They work really well. And um, uh, as opposed, for instance, to uh, modifying Git and Mercurial to be able to talk to, uh, uh, like a, a distributed cloud-based object store system of some kind, for instance, what Google Code does, um, we decided to keep it simple. The, uh, the file systems, they live on specialized appliances by NetApp, a uh, commercial company, um, and are accessible from the application servers simply using NFS. And then, aside from that, we, uh, we have other, so that we have sort of NoSQL storage, um, like distributed, uh, like map, systems, we get Redis and, uh, and memcached. We use Redis for uh, your, uh, your news feed in the, like the repository activity feed that you see. Uh, and, uh, and we use memcached for well, basically everything that is transient that we can lose. And then the, the data for the, uh, behind the, the, the website is all stored in, or traditionally just in SQL. So we use uh, Postgres SQL in, uh, in the, um, the data is manipulated and accessed basically exclusively through the Django ORM, and, uh, and that works, works pretty well. The only thing is that SQL databases, Postgres is no ex uh, exception, are generally kind of hard to scale beyond a single machine, uh, transparently, I should say. Uh, so, like, unless you go implement application-level sharding to, uh, to, to separate your data across multiple databases, transparently scaling an SQL database across multiple machines isn't entirely trivial. And, um, and so, so far, we've uh, kept things simple. We are running a single Postgres database. Uh, it's a very, very big machine and has no trouble with the load at this point. Um, and then for, um, for high availability, we uh, have several real-time replicated uh, hot slaves uh, on standby. Um, but yeah, in the, in the future, should that thing ever sort of become a bottleneck, then, um, which hopefully it will, because it means the service is popular, um, I guess we'd have to look into, uh, into sharding. Uh, I could talk about this stuff all day long, and, uh, and I wouldn't mind to do so either, but there's only 30 minutes, and uh, there's only a few minutes left at this point. So I want to leave it at this. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to take some now. For, we don't have a lot of time, but I'll take some now. Otherwise, come chat to me afterwards. Uh, we also have a booth in the lower level, and so you can just find us there. And, uh, and otherwise, uh, we have a, um, I'd like to invite you for a, a drink tonight. We are hosting a, uh, a drink up in a, a bar nearby, starting at seven uh, at Mein Haus am See. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to invite you over. Come have a drink on us, and you can talk all about this stuff. Um, there's two of my colleagues too, and we're also hiring. So if you want to talk about that, that is also possible. Uh, with that, I want to thank you very much for listening, and uh, hope to see you all tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, would the next speaker like to come up and set his slides up? If you'd like to take any questions over there, Eric. Yep. Um, so, there any questions? Hey, question yep. about uh, the HA proxy and uh, Nginx uh, 
in the beginning of the request. So uh, HA proxy actually has the SSL support. Have you tried that? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Um, so the um, like our, our setup on the web layer is a little a little convoluted, maybe. Um, there are a lot of components, as you saw, and um, that's not strictly necessary. Uh, part of that is sort of uh, organic growth and uh, historical. Uh, so we uh, HAProxy hasn't always been very good at SSL, at least not in our uh, experience. And uh, we've experimented with a ton of different SSL terminators. We've used Stunnel, uh, a bunch of others. And, uh, and at some point, we found that uh, Nginx was, at least for us, uh, the most reliable, and so uh, we've left it there. And I know the situation has definitely changed in HA proxy, so it is something that uh, we intend to re revisit at some point in the future. So yes. Okay, thank you. Hi. Here. Yep. Uh, so I noticed that Bitbucket uses uh, quite a lot of JavaScript on the web server side, and I wonder if you use WebSockets, and if you do, what do you use for them on the server side? Uh, so, do we use WebSockets? Uh, no, we don't currently use WebSockets. We've experimented with WebSockets quite a bit um, for uh, things like, uh, like real-time notifications and pull requests, for instance, those kind of things. Um, but no, we're not currently using WebSockets. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Yep. Um, what's PG Bouncer? What do you use for? PG Bouncer, you said? Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So um, I um, I had a whole spiel about PG Bouncer, um, but I was wasn't no time to uh, to go into it, and there's not enough time to go into all of that right now either. So I invite you to to chat later on. But PG Bouncer is a um, is a, a, a Postgres connection pooling daemon, and um, so we use Django. Django by default doesn't come with any connection pooling, and so uh, getting Django to talk to a database efficiently. Is a, is a bit of a challenge. It's not a challenge, but you need something else. And uh, so PG Bouncer is a, it's part of the, the Postgres project. And basically what it does is it makes stateful connections, long-lived connections to the database, a limited amount. And then uh, you configure uh, Django to talk directly to PG Bouncer. It acts like a database. And, um, and so then if Django opens and closes connections at a very high rate, because you're serving a lot of connections, um, that is a lot cheaper than open and closing actual database connections. And so it bridges between the two. Um, to, uh, to make that more efficient and to also be able to limit the total number of connections that you end up having on your database. There's a lot more to it, by the way. So we actually, if you noticed, we have two layers of PG Bouncer, and there's a, a good reason for that. But yeah, as I said, we'll have to talk about that afterwards because there's no time. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Hi. Hi. Uh, you talked about the machine uh, with the database, like a really large machine. Yeah, as far as I could understand, that's physical machine. So yes. what happens if that goes down? Yeah, so if the, the physical machine goes down, we have, a, uh, we have several uh, real-time replicated hot slaves. So we have streaming replication for Postgres uh, to, have, uh, to have a bunch of uh, slaves. So if the machine goes down entirely, uh, then we, take the, we steal the IP, basically, in, uh, and you know, almost instantly, so you hopefully, move over to the other. Yes, it never happened, by the way, but yes, it's configured that way. All right, thanks a lot.